I'm Charlie Menza. I'm a spatial ecologist with the NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. And today I'm going to be presenting on predictive models to, to predict substrates from remote sensing data like the high resolution bathymetry that we've been talking about uh, over the, the course of today and, and yesterday. Um, I'm thinking that maybe I shouldn't call myself a spatial ecologist. I think it should be hydrospatial ecologist. <laughs> no. um, I am uh, one of several people who have prepared uh, this material. Um, my colleague Iman Mabrook, who spoke yesterday about uh, ground truthing, Will Sauter, and Tim Batista. So we're all at NCOS, and uh, we're all based out of Silver Spring, Maryland. And we work with, with many of you in the room here as partners to collect um, bathymetry and ground truthing data and then develop the, the predictive models. The folks that we've worked uh, a lot with, um, like I said, are, are in this room, uh, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, uh, the Office for Coastal Survey, the Office for Coastal Management, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, National Park Service, and uh, we're starting to work a little bit more with the, the USGS. So what is like that characterization? Well, it's the, the detailed description of a particular place that um, is meant to support a uh, resource management question, policy making decision. Um, there's many different uses of a characterization, but um, it's really important to figure out why we're trying to characterize because it impacts all the decisions we make for, for planning, for data acquisition, for reporting, how we get data to the, the decision makers. Um, there's a lot of things that you could characterize and you want to prioritize your time and energy and characterize the attributes that are, are most important to the decision makers. So we're all familiar with a map like this, a uh, map of elevation. This is for Michley Reef, which is in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. We use the Kongsberg uh, EM2040 to uh, map the elevation and collect bathymetry, uh, sorry, backscatter at one meter resolution. And this was, this was really useful. It helped us understand the reef, its shape, its elevation, you know, was it a hazard to, to navigation? But there's a lot of information in this map that can still be extracted with a little bit more attention and effort. Um, you know, taking a look at it, I can see some dredge deposits, the, the circular features on the, the, the far right. I can see fault lines, the linear features along the bedrock. And I can see changes in texture uh, indicating roughness, um, like uh, Nathaniel talked about earlier, um, indicating boulders or, or cobbles, um, but also the flat, kind of un, unconsolidated uh, sediment. We can start pulling out more information if we collect ground truthing uh, data. So here, a couple of, of locations where we, we dropped a, um, a camera and interpreted those videos and pictures to identify substrate types. Those types of data, when they're combined, help us fill in the gaps between the points because we can, we can develop relationships between the attributes we see in ground truthing data and the variables we collect with remote sensing sensors. That allows us to create a comprehensive picture of things like substrate type for Michelin Reef. So bathymetry and backscatter are, are common remote sensing variables. We've talked about them over the course of two days here. They allow us to create multivariate predictive models for different substrate types. But we can also use derivatives from those to add more information. So uh, calculating the standard deviation, the bathymetric position index, which is the relative elevation of a particular pixel in relationship to its uh, neighborhood, the slope, the curvature, these are all neighborhood statistics for a particular pixel and give us context for where that pixel is in space. From an ecologist's point of view, space isn't necessarily just the, the nearest pixels. So we change that window of that neighborhood to, to add a little bit more context over a range of spatial scales. So you can create the standard deviation over 10 meters, 100 meters, or 
kilometer. And all of that information could be valuable for a particular biological uh, well, species that you might be interested in. So this is the type of models that our office is creating um, on Michley Reef and in other places in the Great Lakes. This is for substrate type, where we used about um, 100 different ground truthing points collected using a drop camera uh, to model with, with high reliability the substrate um, of, of Michley Reef. And we've developed other models for this particular area as well, like a biological cover for for invasive mussels. So another example I wanted to talk about um, is some work uh, we just finished up in, on the north shore of the Bayfield Peninsula. If, um, if you know Cornucopia, Wisconsin, just um, offshore of there um, and offshore of the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. So this data um, was collected to two meter resolution and there was a backscatter collected for the area as well. And, um, and we also calculated derivatives. So standard deviation, curvature slope, those sorts of things. Those were all used to segment the bottom into patches of the lake bed that, that had similarities. So internally homogeneous areas across the different attributes of remote sensing data that, that we collected. Um, those polygons are an unsupervised way of distinguishing the bottom. And then we used these polygons and the attributes within them to help us create a um, efficient sampling design where we were trying to collect information on features across uh, geographic space and also space uh, in those uh, variables for remote sensing data. Kind of zooming in a little bit here, um, this is an image showing a background of backscatter uh, with a gradient uh, moving from uh, right to left, uh, from coarse sediment to fine sediment, and um, the polygons that, uh, that we use to, to segment the, the lake bed. So you may have heard of, of this approach um, called a geographic object-based image analysis. And it allows us to pool you know, similar pixels and you can kind of see how that works out for this particular backscatter variable. But there are many others that feed into the uh, discrimination of those polygons. Superimposed on the image of polygons and backscatter are also the location of five of our ground truth points. And you can see how um, cobbles and silt are distinguished based on the, the brown and yellow colors uh, across that gradient. And for this particular area, um, we used uh, random forests to associate the, the variables that, that we were collecting in ground truthing data with the, the remote sensing layers um, to develop layers like this, uh, distinguishing fine sediment from coarse sediment and bedrock. Um, and uh, this was a very uh, useful approach. It gave us high accuracy. It helped us understand the, the variables that were collected with remote sensing that were important to substrate types. Um, and you can see uh, slope backscatter, the bathymetric position index, uh, rugosity, and, and depth were all uh, really important for, for substrate discrimination. And I actually have those listed in order of importance for this particular model. And what's surprising to me is depth is, was actually the, the fifth of, of those five important variables. The, the texture and the backscatter um, were, were more important on that list. Um, so I think Admiral Evans asked earlier, you know, what, what sorts of lessons did you learn from modeling to Nathaniel that could be useful for a hydrographer? And, you know, one of them uh, is, and, and this probably everyone knows, uh, it's intuitive, but um, poor data quality is going to give you a poor predictive model. Uh, there are many different types of artifacts that exist in hydrographic data that um, are hard for any predictive model to distinguish from, uh, from reality. 
Uh, and so artifacts create uh, more time and effort for people to process the data. They create weaker relationships between the, uh, the variables you're interested in and the remote sensing layers. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times modelers, mappers, will use lower resolution outputs than the uh, data is inherently capable of to increase prediction accuracy. And, um, and then you start losing value, right? As, as you go further and further, uh, lowering your resolution, trying to, to get a more reliable uh, map. So this particular image shows a couple, shows a couple of those artifacts in, um, in a data set that we used uh, next to a sinkhole. There's some, uh, some areas of high uh, depth variance in the um, the, the north uh, west corner there, which we're unsure if those are real or not, and that that means we need to process that data. Uh, we need to look at it a little bit more, and potentially need to ground truth that information. So we found backscatter was incredibly important for any substrate type map. Um, going back here to Michele Reef in Lake Huron, and this, this map shows backscatter, um, where uh, the lighter colors show a stronger um, reflection, um, darker colors weaker, and there are four different areas highlighted here with the, um, the information uh, about their substrate types that we, we garnered from ground truth data. So silt, coarse sand, bedrock, pebbles. And you can see in the backscatter that these four areas are, are different based on their backscatter properties. Um, when you look at elevation for these particular areas, you would see no difference. They're perfectly flat. You can't, you can't distinguish them. Um, so backscatter was critical to being able to, to discriminate amongst these four substrate types. The spatial alignment between ground truthing and remote sensing layers is incredibly important. Um, we, we had minimum mapping units of about 100 meters squared. Um, we found those were useful because of some uncertainty we had using our drop camera. We weren't exactly sure we, where we were. Some people use pixel-based analyses for predictive models. And um, although there are ways to get positional accuracy within one meter, if you have a one meter pixel, those are incredibly difficult. And so if you can expand out um, your, your minimum mapping unit for your predictions, that really helps you get better accuracy and understand uh, in, in what location uh, you are. So I think I touched on this yesterday a little bit, but um, we spend a lot of time ground truth. So this is a one by one kilometer uh, area where we dropped a camera and we spent, I think about a day and a half ground truth. Um, and that's just the data collection. That's not the data processing. It then took weeks for interpreters to, to collect all the attribute information for this area. And we felt that was really important for us to be able to distinguish not only the substrate types, um, but uh, biological cover types, the geoforms, um, different characteristics of the lake bed. Uh, and the quantity of data is important, but another parameter is the, the balance, the spatial balance and the class balance of your ground truthing sites. You wanna spread out your effort geographically so that you're not clustered in one area because that can bias your results. Um, you don't want to, uh, to collect data from only one class because then you won't know um, if, if, you, if you have sufficient information to model your, the other classes you're trying to predict. Uh, this was another one that was a surprise to me in the Great Lakes because I come from a coral reef mapping environment where there are very strong gradients between coral reefs and uh, the sand that surrounds them. And and there's not a lot of different types of substrate, you know, it's coral or, or sand in, in most circumstances. And in the Great Lakes, you, you have clay. And when we were collecting bathymetry data off the coast of Manitowoc, Wisconsin, we saw all these amazing mounds, these outcrops that came up meter, two meters off the, the lake bed. And initially, we, you know, we were scratching our head, what, what are these things? We thought they were bedrock. When you looked at them under uh, a camera, they had fractures. Um, 
they looked hard when the, when the camera uh, came into contact with them. And for a year, we didn't know what these were until we had some help from the University of Wisconsin. They sent some divers down and um, they had a, a diver with a, a knife actually stick the knife into these things. And they ended up just being very hard clay. And they're so hard that, that blocks come off of them, just like you would see you know, on, a, on a mountainside. So um, different types of ground truthing may be necessary to get adequate information for, um, for accurate verification and, and better predictive models. We are also developing models for substrate uh, biotic cover geoforms um, that fit the coastal and marine ecological classification standard. And the reason for that is we do a lot of work in postage stamps distributed across the Great Lakes. And at some point we want to combine all those and we want to combine them with data that, that you all collect. And so if we have a common nomenclature, a common name for different features and we use the same thresholds for how we distinguish substrates, we can compare these things as apples to apples and, um, and start to, to integrate our data sets together. Um, and that's for, for us working with other people's data set. But even internally, we had to come up with a standard because we have different mappers looking at the data in our, our own office and we want them to be using the same decision rules. I think this has come up several times, um, but understanding uncertainty is, uh, is really valuable. No model is 100% correct, or it wouldn't be called a model. Um, knowing where it's wrong and how it's wrong and potentially how to fix it is um, where understanding uncertainty comes into play. So I have up here um, what mappers probably are familiar with. It's called a confusion matrix, and it basically compares um, what something is based on the ground truthing information that you collect versus what you predicted it to be. And so numbers in that gray diagonal indicate um, uh, confirmation that your prediction is, is what you expected. And then any numbers that are off that diagonal indicate some sort of misclassification. And this is, this is useful for model development because model development is an iterative process. You might make one of these and then figure out, hey, I didn't do a good job. I need to, to figure out you know, how to do better. Put more ground truthing points in a particular substrate type. Um, collect more ground truthing data uh, or, um, or use a different modeling approach. Um, it's also useful for decision makers. So these maps are made for people to make decisions, you know, where to put a wind farm, where to put a protected area, where to put a, a navigation lane and providing the uncertainty where the model does a good job and where it does a poor job is, is helpful for them to make the, the right decisions. Um, and, and also understanding just general model reliability. Um, you know, this is a good model, this is a bad model. We want to quantify that um, and, and be upfront and transparent when we don't do a good job. Uh, some data is better than no data, but knowing you know, that relative level of, um, of reliability, I think is important when you're making decisions. Actually, I, want, I wanted to go back here. Um, and, uh, and talk a little bit about our accuracy assessment approach because I, I missed it on a different slide. Um, I showed uh, about 100 different ground truthing sites for Michelin Reef. That was used for training our models. We actually collected a whole other independent data set, an accuracy assessment data set, which was also about 100 different data points, which were not used to train the models, but were then used to test the information to see if we did uh, an accurate representation. And so those independent data sets are what are used in this confusion matrix. Communicating results is important. So having a great model doesn't mean anything unless people are using it. Um, so one of the things that our office has developed, um, my colleague Ken Bruja in particular coded uh, uh, a program called Biomapper, which is an online uh, website where our data is, um, is available for anyone to see. So there's a map of all of the different remote sensing layers. There's a map of our predictions. 
there's annotations of our ground truthing data. And if you click on any of the points where we have ground truthing data, you can get a video. So if you wanted to do your own annotation, uh, you would be able to do that. And I really like this format because it provides all the data in one place. You can see the ground truth thing with the remote sensing, with the interpretations, and kind of drill down through all those different layers to see how, how things are done. Then I wanted to end with some ideas for, for future work, where we're going. Um, so some of this work uh, is funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, I think we heard from John Brett yesterday that they're working in the Eastern Apostle Islands as part of that collaborative project. Um, there's also an ongoing effort to collect LIDAR data uh, for the entry to Green Bay. Um, so that's the remote sensing area. And um, we're gonna be helping with the ground truthing and the map uh, development um, for those places. These areas are larger than what we've currently worked in. And so we are, um, we are ramping up capacity and thinking about uh, automated annotation methods um, and also cloud uh, platforms for, for keeping ground truthing data. So um, for those uh, who, who might be working with ground truthing data in, in larger programs, things like uh, Tater, uh, just short for annotator or, or C2 are ways to put videos and imagery on the cloud and have a distributed network of people interpret those data. And we're looking at, at those solutions for, um, for our work uh, as part of GLRI. We're also interested in standardizing our workflows. There's lots of different people who are gonna be working on this project. We want them to be using the same decision rules um, and, uh, and coming up with, the, with similar outputs. And then um, for many of these locations, we're combining multiple sensor types. So there's LIDAR, um, there's potentially aerial imagery, there's multi-beam echo sounder information. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about ways to how to integrate all those data sets so it can create a seamless map uh, of the, the things that people are interested in. And then um, enhanced biological surveys is, a, is another component to, um, to our work that, that we're trying to, to further develop. We want to know where the fish are, where the mussels are, and sometimes those things aren't measured uh, in the same way as a geophysical parameter. Um, so we've, we're thinking of you know, split beam echo sounders and um, and looking at water column data collected from multi beam to try to get at you know where the biomass is in the important places uh, that exist throughout the Great Lakes. So um, there was a question I think yesterday about GLRI and you know has has that increased recently? And from my perspective, I think it has. Um, you know, I've been part of a GLRI collaborative mapping effort for a couple of years now, and um, just this year, uh, a a new increase in funding for GLRI collaborative mapping happened, which will extend for the next three years. And um, that was thanks to Heather Stewart and uh, her leadership. To, to show how our previous work with lake bed mapping could support decision makers and um, really increase, I think it was by five fold, um, the amount of funding that we have for, for lake bed mapping. So expect to see these kinds of postage stamps increase in size and start to overlap um, across the Great Lakes. With that, I'll finish and take questions if you have any.